grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, working in you through God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Part of God's word for our special consideration this special day is written for us in our gospel lesson. The last two verses of John chapter 15 and some verses from the first section of John chapter 16. <clears throat> when the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also are going to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I did not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, when you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm, there's a golden sky and a sweet silver sound, song of a lark. Walk on through the wind. Walk on through the rain. Though your dreams be tossed and blown, walk on. Walk on with hope in your heart. And you'll never walk alone. You will never walk alone. Most of you recognize that song, right? From the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, The Carousel. Carousel? No? Okay. It was pretty old. It, it premiered in 1945, almost when World War II was almost over. And that song became just an instant hit throughout the country. Maybe because it talked of that idea of, of triumph in, in times of, of great adversity. But it stayed popular. It stayed popular through the 50s. It stayed popular through the 60s. And then it gained new prominence when a, a rival band of the Beatles, by the name of Jerry and the Pacemakers, took it to the top of the charts again. And then it was adopted as the anthem of the Liverpool Football Club. I know it's not really football. It's soccer. But they call it the Liverpool Football Club. And it has been ever since. And, and those people, those teams, and those fans say nothing but great things about this song. This anthem, they say, has carried them to some amazing come-from-behind victories in the past, as well as carrying them through some just heartbreaking losses and some really troubling times, including a stadium crush in which 96 people were killed and hundreds of others were wounded. A powerful song. A sentimental song, but, but really when you think of its original context, it, it shouldn't be that great of a song, right? I mean, in the play, I don't know, I've not seen it, but I've read about it, the, the main character is a carnival barker. And this song comes about after he stabs himself after a bungled robbery and dies in his lover's arms. And then her cousin comes and sings this song, and I think it's a way of saying... Well, Billy's not really gone as long as you hold him in your heart. Meh. But if you think of this song and the words of this song, I guess it could have a different meaning, right? I know sometimes when my wife and I listen to the same song on the radio, we're thinking of it from completely two different opposite points of view as what it means, or at least what it means for us. And I'll take this song, especially the way that that Elvis sang it, because he intended this to be a gospel song when he performed it, and I, I think he was right in that way. And then it can be meaningful, and then it can be very powerful. But if you want something even more meaningful and even more powerful, take this little valedictory speech that we just heard with you. This is Jesus giving a, it's a goodbye speech. That's, you know that's what valedictory, valedictorian means? It means the person who says goodbye. And so here Jesus gives this speech, and it's not like the valedictorian speeches that you hear at this time of year in the, the high schools and the, 
the colleges. Oh, yes, all you graduates, you're so, so special. Now what you want to do is go out there and grab everything that you want in this life and chase your dreams and go out there and get it. it it's, it's not really like that at all. But if you listen to this valedictory speech and you take it to heart, this is way more motivational, way more empowering and way more encouraging. Yeah, I know, I, it, it's a bit of a flashback. We're at Pentecost and this takes us all the way back to Holy Week again, but we, we, we can do that. We have movies and television programs that do flashbacks with us. And so for this valedictory speech, we go back to the night before Jesus died. It's that upper room where he has just given his church that amazing sacrifice, that sacrament of his own body and blood for his people. And now they're getting ready to go out the door so that this Jesus can finish being our Savior by going through the, the horrifying suffering ahead and, and finally giving himself up into death on the cross. And that doesn't sound that awe-inspiring and motivating maybe or confidence-inspiring, but listen again as the valedictorian sets the scene here. He, he's not blowing sunshine up anyone's skirts. He just starts out by saying things the way they really are. Now I am going away. Now I'm going away. Wait, 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 Jesus. You just told us how bad it's going to get, that it's going to get tougher than we've ever seen it, that, that people are going to hate us and they're going to persecute us and they're going to despise us and they're going to look down on us for all the same things that they don't like about you, but you were just telling us that it was going to be okay, that we can make it through all this, that, that we don't need to get raptured out of this sinful world, that we don't have to retreat or withdraw, that we can just walk on, on into this and but you're leaving? You're leaving us here alone? That changes everything. And Jesus replies, you're right, it changes everything. But not the way you were thinking. It actually changes things for the better. Now, it's a little hard for us sometimes to see it, like, just like it's hard for that mother of the preschooler to see that she's supposed to let that little three or four-year-old go into that classroom even though that little three or four-year-old doesn't want to. He wants to hang under her leg. And he's crying and he's sad. So she's just going to go in and sit with him and coddle him and comfort him and, and make sure that he doesn't have anything that makes him feel uncomfortable. Does anybody see anything wrong with that picture? She's not helping. She's not helping unless it's helping to make this, this person an emotional invalid for the rest of his or her life. What helps is, is letting that that child go on to that next stage and have that little tiny bit of independence so that he can progress. Just like the dad who's teaching the child to ride the two-wheeler with no training wheels. He can't hang on to the back of that seat forever. Eventually, you got to let go. You can't be still hanging on to the back of their seat while they're riding their bike to high school anymore. Sometime along there, you have to let go. And that's what Jesus is saying. But for Jesus, it's way more than that. It's not just letting us go independently off on our own. He knows that's not going to work. For Jesus, it's way more than that. It's like in those Clint Eastwood movies, and there's a bunch of them like that, where either the, the townspeople or the people in the mine or the, the settlers on the prairie, whatever it is, they're all just agonizing because here their hero, this 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 gunslinger guy that was going to protect them and, and stand up for them against all the bad guys, he left, and, and now what do we do? Not realizing that he left to go face all those bad guys on his own without them getting in the way. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's going off to do what no one else could do that he had to do for all of us. Yeah, he leads his brothers in arms in the trenches, but, but not because he's going to run off and, and try to get help. He leaves because he is the only help. And he draws the machine gun fire on himself. And he has the artillery strikes directed against his own person. And the, the airstrike comes in on, on Jesus, the Son of God, so that the rest of his companions can escape what he didn't. See, he's still finishing up his mission that he is the only one who's capable of doing, suffering the price for the guilt of all people ever in this world. Paying that final price by dying as the perfect sacrifice, being buried as that last humiliating step 
of his state of humiliation. But then to come back up the steps. To go through those stages of the exaltation where the coming down those steps in humiliation was what it took to pay for all of our sins. Going back up those steps so that we could know for absolutely for sure that all of that is taken care of for us. As he passes through the gates of hell and, and gives that triumphant one man march through the gates of hell saying, I have defeated all you see here. And then he rises from the dead, defeating even death itself to prove his godness and to prove our savedness. And, and, and the fact that he was right when he says, because I live, you will live also. And to know that we have resurrection too. And then, and then yes, then to rise into the heavens of the heavens to be able to powerfully direct and, and lovingly guide everything for the best of his people ever and always. Not as the God-man locally defined in one place where he could be around a certain number of people for a certain amount of time, but as the God-man everywhere at the same time using all that power and authority and glory he has at God as God. This is the final stage for his universal and abiding presence so that he can say, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, and you can know it for sure. Yeah, good thing he left, right? Another good thing he left as, as this main component of being the one who abides and remains permanently, his presence everywhere, is that he does it through the Holy Spirit. And now, part of this Jesus stages of the completion of this receiving back all his authority and godness and power is this sending of the Holy Spirit for the triune God to do his whole thing. For this third person of the triune God to do his specialty. Maybe you could picture it as, as there's this, this nice metal platter and it's got a pitcher in the middle of, uh, maybe it's your favorite ice cold tap beer, or maybe it's lemonade, or whatever your beverage of choice in that nice pitcher, surrounded by all these frozen mugs around it. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? A nice setting. But if it stays like that, it's not. If it stays like that with that pitcher sitting there the whole time, none of that liquid that's in that pitcher is getting into any of those glasses to serve its real full purpose. That pitcher has to be removed from its setting so that it can pour into those glasses. And our Jesus is telling us he needs to be removed from this visible setting to be able to pour out his Holy Spirit into us so that the Holy Spirit can, can make this going away of Jesus actually more advantageous for us than even if we had his physical, visible presence here in front of us. The paraclete, Jesus calls him, the, the one who, who builds us up and, and gives us what we need to have confidence. The counselor, the one who motivates and encourages. And, and this isn't just some, some psychological voodoo. Like, you can do this. Be that little engine that I think I can, I think I can. No, no, because you can't. No one can. God says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. This is the only way it works. Jesus doesn't call him the spirit of the times or the spirit of self-actualization or the spirit of little help over here. He calls him the spirit of truth. Because he's the one who says things exactly the way they are. As Jesus puts it, so he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Now I suppose sometimes it's possible that we in our Lutheran circles give a little short shrift to the Holy Spirit. Not the way that we get attacked by the Charismatics and the Pentecostals for. Uh, that's a, a whole different thing. They think that they are emphasizing the Holy Spirit when they're really just emphasizing themselves. They're looking for resulting gifts that, that separate people and put them in different categories. You are a regular Christian. You're a nominal Christian. You're a spirit-filled Christian. You're a good, better, or best Christian in, in a place where God wants to put people together through the truth of his holy word. And it's a way of sometimes looking at me, 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 instead of looking at Jesus, 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 who does everything for our salvation but okay, maybe sometimes we do forget a little bit about the third person, the co-equal third person of the triune God. I mean, we tend to think a lot of the Heavenly Father as we pray to Him, right? Or as we think of creation and the preservation 
of his universe and especially the world in which we live. And we think, obviously, of the Son of God, the one who came and gave himself for our sins, the Redeemer, the Savior, but, but God, the Holy Spirit? Do we think about him that much? I don't know. Maybe if you could take what we say in our creeds in the third article and kind of put it together and condense it, wow, that guy does a lot, right? That's the part about giving us saving faith and the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, and, and, and the, the preservation of the faith and the, the living our lives of sanctification because of what we have in the, 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 the final making us alive fully at the, the judgment day. There's a lot in there on the, on, the, on the Holy Spirit. He's responsible for tons of great stuff. As Jesus talks about him, he talks about him as doing the, one, the work of convicting or convincing. It says he's the one who convinces of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's all the Holy Spirit doing that. Convincing that, that what God says is sin is. And that, that it, it matters. And it's a front to his holiness. And it's a rebellion against his almighty, infinite authority. And it's something that none of us can fix for ourselves. But that Holy Spirit also convinces us that through the gospel good news. What Jesus has done by his perfect life and death and his payment for us on the cross, that means not only does this sin not get counted against us, it doesn't have to control us either. And really there's just the one sin that's, that's impardonable or unpardonable or unforgivable. And it's not because it's too big for Jesus to have paid for it, but it's because it's the sin of unbelief that rejects that only way of God giving us that gracious gift that he offers for absolutely everyone. And so those people who refuse that, who reject that, they're saying they don't want to be with God. They want to be away from God. They want to be separated from God, which is really sad because they might not realize it, but with God is the only place there can be true joy and peace and happiness and perfection. But those who believe this convincing of the Holy Spirit, those who believe because of the Holy Spirit's work of using God's word to put faith in us, we're not only convinced that we need this Savior, that we ha can't save ourselves, we're convinced that we have this Savior. And we have his righteousness, the righteousness that his word explains in Romans 3. So no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law, but completely apart from the law, the righteousness from God has been made known. The righteousness from God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. And then we're back to the Holy Spirit again, aren't we? The one who uses that message to put that faith in us and maintains that faith in us and, and builds it up until the final judgment. That, that judgment that the Holy Spirit himself convinces us that there's there's, there's no condemnation in it for us at all, but just this enjoyment of everything God's word has always promised us. And then we realize that Jesus' visible departure, that's only a way for him to be even closer to us than ever before, as close as his word and, and sacraments that the Holy Spirit uses again to give us faith and maintain that faith and get that faith to, to produce and make it bud and flower and fruit and of course we all want that of course we want to stay connected with that and there's only one way to stay connected with that the holy spirit working through the word you know what a bouncy house is right that they have at those children's parties and the kids all jump in those inflatable house things a bouncy house you've seen the one we've had out at the outreach thing at waller park right okay if you've seen one of those hopefully you know that they have a little fan, a blower on the side, and it's got that tube there. You've all seen that or at least heard it. Or maybe one of your kids has tripped over it and disconnected it. And then you know what happens if the fan's not connected to it. The bouncy house collapses. That's why Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit. That's what keeps us connected. That's what keeps blowing life into us. We need to be connected to that, that fan of the Holy Spirit. That's how he keeps operating in us through the gospel, keeping us from collapsing making us able to be useful, making us be able to serve the purpose he's given us and keeping us mindful of our eternal home. And then every step until we get there, keeping us always knowing we will never walk alone. Amen.
The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our God, we now have the opportunity to, come to declare and confess the Christian faith we share. This morning we do that using the words of the third article and its meaning. Would you please stand as you're able? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. 